The good news is, I spent 28 years in New York, so I am <laughs> audible on a regular basis. And that's actually a good introduction because um, we're now neighbors. And I get to say, we're neighbors, y'all. <laughs> it's taken me a year to get rid of the stutter before y'all, right? We're neighbors, y'all, so we're doing better. But I've always had, a, 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 I've known some great friends and some great librarians in Georgia, and I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to talk about what's going on. Today, we're going to talk about thinking differently, re-engineering, reinventing, because I think that as a field, at that level, we need to do some of that. I believe that it is time for a new way of thinking about what we do, what the value of librarianship is, and how it works. So we're going to spend some time on that one. So what I'm really here to do is to provide an invitation. I would like very much to talk about you joining a growing movement and a growing thinking to talk about joining what we call the Knowledge School. Now, the Knowledge School is something we use internally, so you're welcome to come to Columbia whenever you'd like and hang out. But really, this isn't the idea of a school or an academy. This isn't the idea of a degree-granting institution. This is really the idea of a school of thought. We need to really think about, as we move forward, as contexts change, as our communities change, as the problems and issues and opportunities they face change, how do we as a profession change? It's time for us to talk about a new librarianship. It's time for us to talk about something very different than what we've done in the past. Now, that's not because what we've done in the past was wrong or bad. I want to be really clear. This is not a discussion about, boy, you've just wasted the past 20 years cataloging books. Now it's all about Google. This is not that conversation, I promise you. We had to do that work. We had to focus and fixate on materials and classification and reference services and buildings and rethinking to get to the point we are now. Because rethinking and reimagining, recasting, refocusing is the sign of a vibrant and living profession. The only professions that don't ever rethink their major mission statements are professions that no longer matter. Would the number of Scriveners in the room please stand? <laughs> right? We're in a building, I noticed, I'm staying in a building that has looked at how a city grows and refocuses. I'm looking at this beautiful river, looking at the, I was introduced today, thank you very much, for a river walk that goes how many miles? 14 miles to Fort Benning. Right? Remember when we used to build cities with their backs facing rivers because that was in essence the sewer. That was where we put things that we didn't want to see. We're in buildings that were ironworks, in mills that closed. I go shopping these days in a, in a Publix. Consider that an advertisement. In a Publix, right? And the Publix is built in the old Confederate mint where they used to mint money. I personally think this is a great, vast improvement in the use of that facility. Life changes, and we need to change with it. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to be in a school of thought. So what do I mean by a school of thought? Some of you may be familiar with something called the Chicago School of Architecture. So it turns out that most architecture built in major cities was still wood construction all through most of the 1800s. This included New York City, or sorry, Chicago. And then this little thing happened, woman, cow, kick, clandle, boom, most of the city burns. Oops. And they began rebuilding the city. But as they began rebuilding the city, they began to think differently about how you build things. For example, maybe wood, not the best idea. And it happened at the same time as some converging technologies that today we probably take for granted, but at the time it came through an improvement in the production of steel. And we could produce a lot more steel than we used to do. We could do it much cheaper. We could build it as a commodity that then matched the price and in fact was cheaper than even old wood construction. It came at the time a fellow by the name of Otis had figured out how to connect an electric engine to a safety elevator so we could now move up past five stories. 
It changed because there was an economic opportunity, which is when the city was decimated, city leaders, up or down? Up, it's up, I promise. It's okay, don't worry about it. Are we all right? Am I shouting loud enough? Very good, I appreciate it, thank you. It came at a time when city leaders said, we are not going to abandon Chicago. We are not going to move away. We are by God not going to move to New York City. We are going to improve this. <laughs> And they began throwing a ton of money into it. And they began building buildings bigger and bigger. And architects came together in Chicago with this great opportunity, this confluence of different technologies, confluence of capital, confluence of need, and they changed architecture. The modern, modernist skyscraper that we are all used to is a product of people thinking differently about a field. And that was not just people in the Chicago School of Architecture, the University of Chicago. This was architects and engineers and construction workers and financiers. And they came together and they said, we need to think differently about how we do architecture. And they changed everything. And that change, which initially was described as a stylistic change, turned into a social change. Because suddenly we could build tall buildings that could house hundreds and then thousands of and with the elevator, and then with the advancement of telephony, where we could then call back and forth and up and down, we began to concentrate more and more businesses within urban settings. We began to look at the idea of having more people come into the city because we could concentrate our focus. And then when they had more people working together in a place, companies could grow larger, and the modern corporation that now span thousands and thousands of people were born. <coughs> We see the effect of the school of thought that began with how do we design buildings now leading to a mass migration of urbanization around the world. We live in a world now where there are more people in cities than in the countryside. And in rural states like South Carolina, in rural states like Georgia, we see and feel that difference. We're living, we're presenting today in an impact of that world. Closing of the mills was not just a matter of newer technology, it was also a matter of a migration and a workforce and availability of a workforce. And how do we track it? That's the potential impact of thinking differently about a field and a school of thought. That's what we want to talk about today. Because we've seen it in our own field. There was a school of thought that Melville Dewey and Cutter and a bunch of his buddies got together and thought, we need to think differently about libraries at the end of the 1800s. They looked at the growth of industrialization. They looked at manufacturing and the advent of the construction line, of the, of the assembly line. And they said, we're all going to standards. We're all building big industry. How do libraries survive in that world? That was an honest conversation that they had. They said there were plenty of libraries. And it wasn't like people were walking around going, let's close the libraries. We have Google. At the time, it was probably, we got passenger pigeons. People can get, mm. <laughs> I could just see Library Journal 101, how to remove the debris from the passenger pigeon service <laughs> in the men's room. Um, there was a conscious thought that said, how do we change and interact with an industrialized world? It happened in education. It's the reason we put 30 kids in a classroom and expect them to learn. It's still happening in education. It's the reason we put 30 kids in a classroom and test them all on the same test and assume that they will all do equally well. And notice how many school librarians were in this room. We're going to, we'll bond. <laughs> and so what was the reaction? Standardization, Dewey Decimal System. Standardization of services, reference desk, the advent of the reference desk. The idea that librarians need to be connected. This was when the American Library Association was formed so librarians could come together and develop best practice and share best practice because we know that if we do all do the best thing, no matter where you are, libraries will get better. It's the same thinking, which, by the way, has led to Walmart and McDonald's. Because if you can get a Big Mac, it should be the same Big Mac wherever you are in the world, and clearly that's how localities work. <clears throat> My grandmother was visiting Florence, Italy once, and she was time for dinner, and she was getting hungry. <laughs> and she waved down this very nice Italian person and said, we're looking for a nice restaurant for dinner. And the Italian said, oh, you're American. The McDonald's is around the corner. <laughs> they haven't gotten more polite. It's true. Anyway, 
So we began thinking of efficiency as our primary metric. Think about for a moment what you do in your committees. Think about what you do with your statistics. Think about all the amount of time you spend on time. How can we speed this up? How can we get shelving to happen faster? How can we make sure that we have people move efficiently in? How can we efficiently move numbers through the door? Dear God, how many people went into librarianship so they could move more numbers through the door? You can go to a library in Seattle, in Macon, in Atlanta, in Kenya, and in Oslo, and you will find stacks with numerical ratings behind a reference desk waiting for you to help. Is that the field that we want to be in now? Now, this primary concept, this way of understanding libraries has changed more recently. It's changed around the idea of putting information at the center. The rise of library and information science, of the iSchools, of what have you, is the realization that information can be disconnected from institutions. That I don't have to go to a place, and I don't have to subscribe to an organization to get information. It's everywhere. It's data. It's where we're going. Think about for a moment, once again, this school of thought, because it is a school of thought, and how much you have adopted it or it's been ingrained in what you're doing to the point where it's transparent. How many of you have users? How many of you enjoy being used? <laughs> I won't even ask about consumers. Think about that for a moment. This concept of users being user-centric, how we respond to our users, making sure the user experience as well, user experience interfaces. That comes from a school of thought that you have probably been ingrained to since your library science program to this very day. Where vendors sell to you based on this concept of user experience and the idea that they can search. But I want you to decode that for a moment. For example, is access the same thing as impact? In a user, in an information context, our job is to get information to the user, get information to the people who can process it. Because we treat people as processors. You have an input, information, you have a processor, human brain, and you have an output. And you sit there and go, oh, we do Oh yeah? Is your summer reading program about providing more reading material to individuals so that they'll love reading? Input, reading materials, process, people reading, output, love of reading. Think about how much you define as an input, a process, and an output. We get their, their, their checkouts, we look at their loans, and that allows us to therefore understand what they want better. We can create better predictions of what they want to read in the future. If you take those things and you take the human being out of it, you don't call them users or patrons, and you put in box, thing, computer, does it still work? We've gone to the point where we believe that access and informing is sufficient for impact and change. Look at what we talk about in the public library sector. We talk about the public library is the best, last, most available place for people to access the internet. Right? We put this, this is why you need your public library, because you can access the internet. There's other ones, but that, let's just pick that one for a moment. And that's fabulous. But have you ever seen someone walk up at two, what? Walk up to the internet <laughs> with the tubes and the, the YouTube and suddenly go, <sighs> how many people have you seen walking up to the computer and then walking over the desk and going, My kids put pictures on Facebook. Help me. I need to find a job. Help me. This concept that somehow simply providing access, whether it's to books, to materials, to databases, to a building, to the internet, is sufficient for impact is insane. We know they need to be trained in how to use it. We know they need to understand the implications, the repercussions. We know that, for example, on a regular basis, our teams are walking around. Here's how many people, this is the interactive portion of our day, have a smartphone? Keep your hands up, hands up. No, really, it's, it's, give me a minute. <laughs> how many people are on their phones using the internet 
an hour a day. Keep them up. Two hours. Three hours. Five hours. All right. If you have one of these, you are on the internet 24 hours a day. How many people realize the fact that as we speak right now, Tim Cook, who's a lovely gentleman, if he wanted to know exactly where David Lankis was, what he was doing, what apps he was doing, whether he was moving or not, could find it out with a click. How many people realize that when they have this, people can know where you've been? And we look at this like, well, I took this lovely picture of me and my children. I'm going to post it online. Oh, what's geotagging? Now they know exactly where I live. Just having access to a thing doesn't mean you have impact. This idea, if you look at internet adoption, there is a fabulous story to talk about inner city underserved populations and internet access. If you look at African American and Hispanic populations in the inner city of most major metropolitan areas in this country, including Atlanta, including New York, including Los Angeles, Dallas, yeah, all right. <laughs> the stats look really, really, really good for a change. But when you dig into that stat, what you find out is this is their internet access. And you go, yeah, it's my internet access too. You know what you can't do on one of these? You can't write an app. So all the cyber coding camps and coding camps we put together and say, come in and the future is in high tech and we're going to teach you how to program and code. And they go home and this is what they have. They can't do it. In an information world, I give you access. I've done my job. But that's different from saying, I've changed your life. I've improved it. I've made it better. Think about how much time you spend worrying about what databases do we offer and not does anyone use the databases? <laughs> or worse, we got a lot of people using databases. Look at the stats. It's actually one guy going, that's interesting. That's cool. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, use porn on the sites. Our stats would boom! <laughs> and I'm talking to the school librarians. I know. In an information focused world, we become focused on users and technology and data. Now, this is, excuse me, this gets a little obscure for a moment. Think about a user as someone who's defined as its relationship to technology. In other words, when you walk down the street and I say, hi, it's good to see you. You're a great user. We don't do that. <laughs> but when they sit at a computer, we go, oh, you're a user. Right? It's kind of like computer scientists and drug dealers have users. Why are we adopting that metaphor? Because what we're defining, a user is someone who's defined in relation to something else, primarily technology. Not learning, not meaning making, not understanding the world. They are using something. That's very different than impact and making a difference. So in our school of thought, we need to move past this idea to putting knowledge at the middle. What happens when we do put knowledge at the middle? What do I, what I mean by knowledge? Let me give a quick definition. First of all, knowledge is a uniquely human thing. You can't bundle it, you can't pack it, you can't print it, you can't shelve it, you can't store it for later. It's here. It's unique, and even how you understand things is unique to you. And you sit there and go, yeah, Dave, but. Does anyone know, for example, what clouds are made of? Things like this full servers. Good point. Get the blue stuff, how clouds are made That's a good point. No, you're right. We're talking about information. I know. Well, see, that's the thing. We talk about information, people go, well, the cloud. I'm like, no. What's it look like puppy dogs or it's an ant eating a frog, whatever? What are clouds made of? Water. 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 How much do they weigh? Lots. <laughs> Average cloud, they did this wonderful study, about 50 elephants worth of water vapor sitting in the sky. Now, that's a really cool statistic. And I remember exactly where I heard that analogy. I was driving, I was listening to NPR, I was turning up on Jamesville Road, I was going to work in the morning. I remember. So now when I look up at the clouds and I'm looking for, you know, oh, it's a spaceship. 
I said, there are 50 elephants above my head. <laughs> now, you know it's water vapor. You knew it was heavy. But if I asked you, when did you learn that, you probably have no clue. Because you probably learned it in school sometime, and it just became lost over time. But how you learn it, where you learn it, what you connect it to, how you understand it, is unique to you. Two plus two equals four. You go, well, Dave, that's not unique to me. But yeah, it is. Two plus two equals four isn't the unique part, but where you learned it, how you understood it. Oh, I don't like math. Math scares me. Math is horrible because someone I had a teacher that destroyed me, blah, blah, blah. How you understand even these facts and figures are unique to you. How your relationship is to that. We all read the same book. Some people walk away loving that book and it's now the center of their life. Some people get to the third page and go, this is crap, and throw it away. <laughs> the knowledge isn't in the book. It's in your interpretation, decoding, and relating to how you know it. So it's something that's unique. It's a lens of learning, uniquely human. Your knowledge, our knowledge, knowledge as we understand it, is passion. A lot of times we talk about knowledge of science and information as if it's a dispassionate, objective thing. That's the fact. That's the truth. Knowledge, science, truth, reality are passion, passionate things. We talk about scientists as people who are dispassionate. It's not true. Scientists are passionate people that examine the world with dispassionate tools. But where do they come up with the question to begin with? And if you say, well, science has a natural way of knowing the next question, I ask you about climate change and gun control. Why is it that we do not, why is it that we no longer fund those? Is it because science told us they don't matter? Or is it because of, well, I know it's not important. Or I know it's going to lead to a place I don't want to go. So it's socially shaped. How we understand the world comes from this passion. Now, I could go through lovely little, I won't, um, theories and epistemology and philosophy and techniques. But instead, the way I want to talk to you about a new approach to librarianship, a new one based on knowledge and passion and the beliefs. Because I'm firmly convinced that librarians become librarians out of passion. That why you chose librarianship is because you wanted to do good. That you wanted to make a difference. The, the number of librarians that I run into that are librarians because they were good at crossword puzzles has decreased dramatically in the past <laughs> 80 years. And I know it's not for the money. And I know it's not because you love hanging out with users. When I talk to people about why they're a librarian, every librarian that I've met that has, is a good librarian has a story. It's that story that they hold on to. It's that story that they tell themselves when they're cleaning the men's room once again. It's that story they tell them when the toner's broken. <laughs> in the middle of the 12th committee in our mosaic style management system, they just sit there and go, the reason I did this was that kid who I gave the recommendation, they came in the next day glowing about that it's the best book and I get, and they can't stop talking. It's about the mother. It's about a story of literacy coaches, trained librarians, talking to a crowd about storytelling and demonstrating how you do storytelling with your kids. And having a mother come up with their young infant and asking that facilitator, what did you say on this page? Okay, now what did you say on this page? Now, exactly what did you say on this page? And finally, that coordinator saying, why are you asking me about, and realizing that the woman couldn't read. But by God, her child was. That she was going to do everything she could to teach this child how to read. And she was going to work hard at it, not realizing that she had the opportunity to gain that skill too. That's the story. The story you tell is in Casanova, New York in a rich enclave in the poorest county in New York State, where they began offering story time and children's programming in the food pantries. And at the graduation of this, they began giving everyone a new book. A new book, come on. Libraries, new book, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as the librarian, Beverly Kennedy, gave one to this small eight-year-old girl, the girl began to cry. And Beverly said, what's wrong? And the girl said, this is the first new thing I have ever owned. That story that librarianship is about giving people work, 
and value and tools to make a difference. Those are the stories we tell. They rarely start with, and I saw them reach up to the book I just had <laughs> And I knew, I knew that that URL link resolver had solved the problem of getting through the firewall. So I want to talk to you about a really personal way, and I want to do that by talking about what happened on Monday, this Monday. I had a hard time this Monday. Everyone had a hard time this Monday. This Monday, I woke up worrying about Puerto Rico and our response to what do we do in form of crisis and how do we help people move forward. And as I was prepared to be really upset and worried about that, I heard about Las Vegas and the idea of a mass shooting and the dead of people during a celebration. And then I went to pick up my son because I had to take him to an orthodontist appointment at 11 o'clock at his high school. And as I walked in, they had just dismissed, sorry, evacuated the school out to the front of the building because they were investigating in getting a potential bomb in the back of the building. And what I realized at the end of this day, and it was not a good day, was that I was tired. I was just tired. And when I was tired and upset and just wanted to crawl into bed and forget about it, what I realized was, this is not the world I want to live in. Now, I want to be very clear because right now in the crowd I have some people sitting there going, yawn. Some people are sitting there going, oh great, here comes the Democrat. Or some people are probably sitting there going, yeah, here comes the Democrat. But what I want to talk about is not ideology, but idealism. Because I was tired, and when I say this isn't the world I want to live in, I don't think anyone wants to live in this world. I don't think any one of us, I don't care where you are on a political spectrum, want to live in a world where hurricanes destroy lives. I don't think any of us want to live in a world where people kill other people from a 30-story building. I don't think we want to live in a world where kids go to school and have to worry about bomb threats. <coughs> I don't care if you're a Republican, I don't care if you're a Democrat, I don't care if you're a socialist, a communist, a fascist, I don't care. That's not the world we want to live in. And then I remembered, I'm a librarian. And the difference became the idea that my job as an educator as a library science educator, was not to now inform people about what had happened. It was not to communicate out the number of deaths. It was not simply to send out an email message so that people knew what happened. My job was to make the world a better place. My job, your job as librarians, is to make communities smarter, better, happier. Think about this for a moment. What do you do during the day? And you say, well, I catalog books, I shelve books, I check out, I do story time, I do instruction. Why? Why do we do these things? Well, it's a paycheck. It's not a big paycheck, let's be honest. <laughs> we do it because we want to make the world better. I don't want to live in a world where we have 14% of U.S. adults are illiterate. I don't want to live in a world where the number of U.S. adults can't read is 32 million people who can't read. I was talking to someone, they coordinated McDonald's and they coordinated uh, marketing. Everyone remember Monopoly? Right? You get Monopoly, you do whatever. Did anyone know that McDonald's had to, had to deal with Scrabble? I, I didn't either. You want to know why? Because it failed miserably. You want to know why? Because you have to spell to do Scrabble. And when people said, this is not going to work in South Carolina, this is not going to work in Georgia, our literacy rate's too high, McDonald's corporate office said, no problem, we'll have the staff and employees help them through the system, and they had to say, they can't read either. Right? I don't want to live in a world where that happens. I don't want to live in a world where the vast majority of our countries get C-minuses in our education system. 
I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in a world where we look at educational achievement. This is a graph that talks about, these are the countries at the bottom. I know you can read them from the back. <laughs> the squares represent ages 45 to 54, an older generation, if you will. The triangles, the green triangles, represent people 25 to 34, they're children. And what you'll see, once again, without being able to read, is you'll see that the squares go below the diamonds. Why? Because every generation does better than the previous generation. If you spend a little time with this data, however, you will note that there is one exception. The United States. Now this is 2004 data. So you go, well Dave, clearly we've done a better job since 2004. This is percent of adults with an associate degree or higher, in essence some college education. This is data from 2000, 2004 as well, but what you'll notice here is a pattern, right? Up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, down. And what happens is these are younger generation and as you get older, less and less achievement by country except one, the US. Fewer people going to college. I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in a world where we look at incarceration in the thousands. I don't want to live in a world, which by the way, you guys are doing really well in this, but where South Carolina is doing fine, but that's because we probably send most of our people to Georgia. <laughs> and if you break this down, by gender, if you break this down by race, the story gets really bad. I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in a world where in 2015, 43.1 million people in this country live in poverty. The poverty rate for children under 18 was 19.7%. 20% of our children in this country live in poverty. 9.4 million Americans live in extreme poverty. That means that a family of four making less than $10,000 a year. Now, before my academic library colleagues sit there and go, <laughs> not my problem, I don't want to live in a world where 20% of community college students reported being hungry and 13% were homeless. I don't want to live in a world where 58,000 students on our campuses across this country are homeless. I don't want to live in that world. So I had the same prior reaction you did, which was, great, Dave. That's a way to bring down the day. <laughs> is that our job? And by the way, this is not ideology. I don't think the most staunch Republican wants 58,000 college students to be homeless. I don't think the most liberal Democrat is happy with our poverty rate. Now, how we solve those, that may break down ideological grounds, but the idea that we want to solve them does not know politics or ideology. You may think that the way to curb gun violence is more guns or less guns, but you still want to curb gun violence. So the question that I ask you, is that our job? Natural disasters and hurricanes? Literacy, education, incarceration, homelessness, and poverty. I'm a librarian. That's not my job. That's the way of thinking in Dewey. That's the way of thinking in information, which is no problem. We'll inform the world. Look, Dave, it's, we've, success. we've done it successfully. You have stats. You can put your slides together. We walk away. I talked to academic librarians, and they said, my job is not to teach students. That's the professor's job. My job is to give them the materials they need to teach. I think that's true. I think you're responsible for what your students learn. Now, you're not completely responsible, nor will we be completely responsible in solving all these. In other words, I don't think the next ALA will be dedicated to librarians going to the coast of the United States and going in hope that we can dispel the latest hurricane. But I would argue that as librarians, whose job it is to make our community smarter, better, happier, this is our job. And I'm going to talk about this knowledge school and examples of where we've done it. For example, natural disasters. When Hurricane Sandy went up the East Coast and slammed New York City, first time in a huge number of years, the New York 
libraries, public libraries, even though the librarians' houses were destroyed and underwater, opened so that people had a place to charge their devices, to make phone calls, to connect to their families, to bring it together. The New York public librarians didn't look at the hurricane and say, that's not my job, I don't do disaster recoveredness, I'll just wait till it's fixed. They said, no, our job is our communities are hurting and they have a need to make meaning and connect in their life, we are going to open and be there. When in Columbia, South Carolina in 2015, a massive, unusual, multi-day rainstorm led to a cascade of failing dams that flooded the city. The libraries didn't say, oh, I can't wait till they fix that. They opened. Not only did they open, but they became the place where FEMA, whose job it is, they located in public libraries. Why? They located in public libraries not because they were convenient buildings. They located in public libraries because that's where people were, had trust, where they came to learn, where they understood, where they saw themselves. We have to talk about, and by the way, the library didn't just open the doors. They took the bookmobile, they stripped out the books, they put in water, and they began delivering water around them. <coughs> they also didn't just sit there and say, well, I'm sure it worked out just fine. They looked for places where the disaster recovery didn't work as librarians and advocated for them. So as the floodwaters were raising, there was a disabled man who lived in a house. And the water eventually circled the house. Now, I'm sure this is true in Georgia. This is new for me as a New Yorker. But when water circles your house, it doesn't come alone. Water moccasins tend to patrol those things. We don't get gators that far up. But it will kill you, still bad. The man couldn't evacuate because at this point he depended on a motorized chair to move around. And so when FEMA and when emergency people came to evacuate them and they brought a boat, they could not accommodate that chair. They left it. The good news is the water didn't quite make it all the way down and eventually receded. But librarians didn't just sit there and say, oh, that's a shame. They set policies. They began working with public health organizations. They began working with state and city government to figure out how this would never happen again. This happens in employment. In employment, what happened with one library was that people would come to apply for jobs. And they were applying for jobs in custodial work and in package handling, low-skilled labor. But in order to apply for these jobs, they had to fill out an application, dot, 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 online. And so they began showing them how to do it online. And then they found out that not only do they have to do it online, but they're timed. So people who take longer to fill out online applications are seen as less able to do the work. And once again, the librarians didn't say, good news, we have public access. I hope that works out. They picked up the phone and they called FedEx and said, stop it. And they began having meetings and talking about how we can be better in how people learn and communicate. They have a social mission as well as this information or knowledge mission. We see this in literacy. This is Cocky's Reading Express. So I understand I'm in Georgia territory, but in South Carolina, everyone loves a kick-ass chicken. <laughs> and so 10 years ago, as they looked at the literacy rate and what we is often known as the corridor of shame around the PD region, where the literacy rates are so high it is embarrassing, where they can't add any more technology to the schools because if they add another computer, it will be under the hole where the rain can come in. They began to say, how can we change this? How can we get literacy out to this? And so they took the kick-ass chicken, they put them on a bus, and they got athletes, they got people in the business school, they got people in the art school, they put them in the bus, they would drive to the most needy schools in the state, and they would get up and they would do story books. And they would make the kids do the cocky's literacy pledge. I shall read. And they were modeling the fact that if you want to get into college, even if you're good at football, you need to read. And if you want to do anything, you need to read. Now, we did this for a long time, and what we found out is it made us and people feel really good. But we had no idea if it made a difference. Because that's the difference between information and knowledge. Simply going and making us feel good is insufficient. Did it make a difference? 
If you do story time and it makes you feel good, lovely. Do kids actually read based on that? Do parents, are parents able to participate? That was the question we came into. And so we partnered with the Hearst Foundation, we partnered with our College of Education and said, let's figure out if this makes a difference. And you know what we found out? No. Right, he's willing to admit it. Because you can't do one event in one location with one group of people and assume literacy will happen. What you have to do is you have to get the teachers using the same language as the librarians, as the school librarian, as the mayor, as the sheriff's office, as the pizza guy. You need to be in a situation that if you want kids to read, not only do they hear about it in school, they walk out and they go get pizza, and the pizza guy has a little free library and something going, did you read anything today? And they had to have common languages so they could work with parents and teach parents about it. We had a situation, the Richland County Library began doing dyslexia training with their librarians so that when they did story times and such, they would be able to identify children with reading disabilities and then talk to parents about how they could solve it. And they did a big workshop on it. And afterwards, a parent came up, yes, these are all teary-eyed stories, I realize, and said, you know what? My kid was suffering in school. He couldn't read. And I thought it was the school's fault, so I took him out. And I homeschooled and he couldn't read, and it became my fault. I was now failing my child. And it wasn't until this that I realized that my child has dyslexia. And it's not that it's not my fault, but I now have a solution. I can now change those things. That's the kind of stories that we as librarians need to tell, not how many people walked in, not how many people showed up to that workshop, not how many books were checked out as a result, how many kids got to read. We know, by the way, if you're not at reading level by grade three, the chances of you finishing high school drop dramatically. And we know when chances of high school graduation drop dramatically, chances of incarceration increase dramatically. We had a situation, South Carolina, I don't know about Georgia, but South Carolina is really brilliant at business development. We love stealing industry. We're really good at it. There are more German cars built in South Carolina than there are in Germany. Boeing comes down. Boeing builds a high-tech manufacturing. They're going to build airplanes. They're going to build things that fling you through the air. And they go to hire a workforce. There are currently 4,500 unfilled manufacturing jobs in the state of South Carolina. Because they went to hire a workforce, and the workforce had to have basic literacy and computing skills, and they didn't. They said, no problem. We'll go to the high schools and we'll do STEM education. And we'll have maker bots. And we'll teach them about engineering. They'll be thrilled. And you know what they found? They couldn't read. You can do all the STEM enrichment you want, but if they can't read, they can't do the enrichment. So now they're investing in third grade reading. Their idea of preparing the workforce starts at third grade. This is the idea of having impact and making a difference. In education, in education, the Shawnee Topeka County Library said, we want every kid to be ready for kindergarten. How many public libraries have said that? How many school libraries are like, we want them ready? How many academic libraries do it in the form of, we want them to be prepared for first year, critical thinking, information literacy, what have you? And as Shawnee looked around, they said, how do we do this? And they identified one part of the city that was underserved with a high illiteracy rate. And Shawnee County is unique in that they only have one library for the entire city. They don't have branch systems. So they said, how are we going to do this? They didn't just say we're going to offer enrichment and hang out in our building. What they began doing is, well, what's going on there? That part of the city turns out, not only do they not have a library, they don't have bus service. It's a transportation. It's the bottom that people can't get out to jobs, to education, to enrichment. And so they said, OK. Let's talk to the bus service. And when that didn't work or wasn't big enough, they trained their libraries, they trained the staff, they trained community volunteers as literacy experts, and they sent them out into the community. If you want to say that your library is solving illiteracy, improving education, and preparing for kindergartners, and you never leave your building, you are not doing it. If you think the world's problems get stored and held until they walk into your building to be released, you are wrong. In fact, most people are illiterate. The last place they want to be is a public library or an academic library or a school library because it makes them feel stupid. 
We need to get out of those buildings. So they made this happen. They looked at a problem, they looked at solutions, said this is about what people know, not what they have access to, and they went and made it happen. This is my favorite. Cuyahoga County Public Library outside of Cleveland, Ohio. The state was pulling back workforce development efforts. They were closing social services and workforce development efforts. And the public library said, we'll do it. And they got state funding to do it, by the way. This is also part of this story. And so you could come in and you could do workforce development. You could do workshops, trainings, resume building, skills, blah, blah, blah. And they began connecting. Then they, they found out that's not enough. That's for the people who can come in. And they found one population where workforce development was crucial, and, they had, and you could never send a bus there to help them, and that was the incarcerated population. They looked at the prison system and said, people get out of prison, and the recidivism rate is high, and people walk. Because they don't know what to do after. So they went into the prisons, and they began a prison library system. They worked with Overdrive so that they could bring tablets in to do the education program, they couldn't be connected to the internet, so Overdrive built a system that would allow them to have standalone machines so people in prison could read. So people in prison could do education, listen to audiobooks. And then, when they were coming to release time, they became part of the release procedure that said, if this is where you're going, this is your local public library, you have an appointment on Tuesday to meet with a librarian. If we're going to talk about making our communities better, we need to talk about all parts of our communities, and we need to realize that happens in all places. Then what they found out is not only are people coming to workforce development, but in doing so, they tend to be a transient population. They tend to be people who move a lot and have new apartments on a regular basis. And it turns out, by the way, that the number one reason people lose food aid is because they don't check in because they don't have a regular address. In essence, you have to check in on a regular basis, say, I'm still here, I still need the service, etc. And people who are moving all the time, or working three jobs, or don't have access to transportation, couldn't get there, they lose their food service. Their kids go hungry. And what the library said is, you know what? We're going to give them a library. And whenever they walk into our, one of our libraries, anywhere, and they swipe, to check out a book, to borrow a computer, to go to one of our programs, that's going to count as a check-in. So the public library said, we're going to be part of solving not only the incarceration problem and part of the jobs problem, we're going to be part of solving food and social service problems. Now your community may not be about jobs, it may be about literacy, it may be about different things, but what are you doing to identify the major needs of your community? My academic library colleague. What are the major needs of people coming in, preparedness within their freshman year, transition to graduate programs, understanding information literacy, understanding what a proper source is? What is it and what are you doing to solve that problem? And if your answer is we did a really nice info guide on it, you're not solving that problem. This is what knowledge-based thinking is about. In homelessness, in homelessness, at the Free Library in Philadelphia, in downtown Philadelphia, they had a homelessness problem. They had a huge homeless population. They would come in, they would use the facilities, they would be there all the time, and people were starting to say, this is not working. They had a, one trustee that came out after a major author series went into the men's room and said, oh, this is really not working, fix it. And the librarian sent out a call to librarians around the country going, how do you address the homelessness problem? You know the results they got? This is the vagrancy laws. Make sure that any flat, seatable surface you put spikes on, we call it pigeons, but really keeps people from hanging out on places they can sit. And the librarians looked at these responses, and they said, the homelessness problem isn't that we have homelessness people in our library. It's that we have homeless people. And they began to say, how can we solve this problem? So the first thing they did was they hired homeless folks to be the bathroom attendants. And I know that doesn't sound grand, but it gives them some position and authority. Then they built a cafe, and you're going, they built a cafe? They built a cafe. It was funded by Bank of America. All the pastries and food they gave out came from local bakeries because they didn't want to be seen as in competition. The training and coffee came from Starbucks. And the people were hired in a homelessness to work transition program. They built a cafe because it was not going to solve homelessness. Let me be really clear. 
I don't say you as a librarian are going to solve all the problems. But you need to address them. You need to be part of the solution. When Shawnee County was education, it wasn't that they didn't have schools. They needed, the schools needed help. It wasn't that there weren't social services available. They just needed help to connect to them. And why? Because as librarians, our job is to help people be better, know more, be smarter. It's not access. It's not a building. It's not a reading material. I love the love of reading. Put up your read posters. I hate the read posters. Put up your read posters all you want. <laughs> world's largest, most successful library marketing campaign, and it has nothing to do with libraries. Isn't that great? Because you can only read in libraries? I also don't like, I'm not a big fan of the love of reading. I like the power of reading. Right? It's not because you, you know, read because it'll make you feel good. Read because if you don't, you lose opportunity. It's a basic, necessary, democratic right to do it. So this change of thinking, and once again, time in epistemology and the difference between knowledge and information and data. We can spend time in theory. I wrote books on them. They're lovely. Check them out from your local library so you don't have to spend them. <laughs> but the point is, as a field, our future, our transition, our change comes in a shift from efficiency and industrialization, comes from a shift away from informing and providing resources to a shift on meaning and learning. When you think about why you became a librarian, when you think about what it is that is most rewarding, when you think about what it is you want to do and pass on, when you think about why librarianship is a noble profession, I believe it is because you are dedicated at your heart to helping people find their place in this world and to make meaning of their situation to understand what their capabilities are and how they can interact and change the world they're about. It's not a Republican ideal, that's not a Democratic ideal, that's not a liberal idea, that's not a conservative idea, it's an ideal. And so the knowledge school, this knowledge school of thinking, which is, yes, we can worry about cataloging and shelving, lovely. If you want to have cart races, have cart races. Just do them outside. So that people can see that librarians actually have fun every so often. <laughs> and then invite people to participate. Justin Hankey was at Chattanooga Public Library. He got a 3D printer. Rather than going back into his office and figuring it all out, he took the bits and pieces, put it right in the middle of the youth services room, and went at trying to fix it. And as people would walk by, he goes, hey, I'm doing this. Want to help? Hey, you want to try this? He said at one point they had to take a hammer and a chisel, because they had like this much plastic off of this thing. And what he did was he demonstrated that he had a passion for learning, and that was what he was teaching. What do you teach people? What do you do? Yes, we need to work with the schools on illiteracy. Yes, we need to work with social agencies on poverty. Yes, we need to work with all of these people. And increasingly, in the divided world we have, we are the only people remaining to do it. When we look at our courthouses and our town halls, and they become polarized. When we look at the social norms that we used to have, the one that stands still, the one that stands in the midst of the rubble of a common understanding of our communities is librarianship. We talk about fake news. We talk about this idea of bad information and such. It is not because people are choosing bad information. It is not because they are illiterate. It is because what we have defined as good news was always a social construct. And that construct is falling apart. It's not the world I want to live in. So what I want is I want to bring people from the academy. I want to bring people from practice and advocacy, cultural heritage, commercial governance. We need to come together and say, we are not happy with this world. And our jobs as librarians are not to document it. Our jobs as librarians are not to provide you access to stories that will destroy your soul. Our jobs as librarians are not simply to provide a space. Our job as librarians is to provide you meaning, connection, understanding, and opportunity. 
And we're going to take this not only in the United States, but in Asia, Africa, and Europe, and we're going to produce mentoring networks and education and continuing understanding of this. And we're going to begin to reshape this profession. Just as you've had this first conference in a reshaped concept of Georgia librarianship, we need to reshape the entire field. We need to look and say what we have done for the past 4,000 years has been immensely valuable and has changed society. We need to continue that tradition. We need to continue a tradition that started in places like the Library of Alexandria that wasn't a big container full of scrolls. It was a think tank that helped inform the leaders of that nation. We need to take things like when the information came out of Moorish and Muslim libraries into the Western Europe and created the Renaissance and brought around new thinking. That when communications and scholarly communications happening in our academies and such connected people that led to an enlightenment. And we need to connect people that have made us aware of the cost of the enlightenment and colonialization. We need to work with our communities because they need us now more than ever. And we are the right people to do it. We have partners and we will partner with them all. We have a grand quest before us. We have the tools, we have the knowledge, and we have the passion. But we must engage it. That's my invitation to you today, which is not to stand by and say, not my job. Not to stand by and look at the suffering of our communities and say, unless it comes through my door, I will ignore it. We need to leave our building. We need to leave these things and go out and say, how can I help you? How can I make your life better? How can I make your life more rewarding? You want to talk about the future of libraries. It's not about, will we get this tax base? Will we get this millage passed? It comes from, will our communities survive? We can create the world that we want. We will do it with our communities. We will create the world that brings about meaning. Because the mission of a librarian is to improve society. That's your mission. We do it by helping people learn, by knowledge. Or, to make this more simply, to create the world our communities deserve. That's what we're about. Every day you wake up and you hear the news and you sit there and go, I can't deal with it again. When I came back that Monday, and I sat, laid on a couch, comatose, my 17-year-old son came out to me and he goes, Dad, I, I see you've been having a bad day. I said, yeah, it's been a bad day. He goes, Dad, what you taught me is that we fix bad days. He goes, so I went online and I scheduled to give blood. And I'm going to do double reds, even though it scares the hell out of me. And then I'm going to go to school and I'm going to start a campaign where we're going to take donations and money and material for the Puerto Rico. And what my son taught me at the end of that bad day is what I hope we all take away, which is if this is not the world that you want to live in, you have a hand in changing that. As librarians, I would argue you have a responsibility for changing that world. No one's going to ask you. No one's going to give you permission. There will be no committee on world changing that will develop a policy in which way you change the world. It will happen as a person, as an individual with a heart and a mind and a passion and a bias that stands up and says, no, this is not what we are. We are better than this. We are better than this in my community. We are better than this in my school. We are better than this in my college. We are better than this in my government, in my agency, in my business. And as librarians, we will lead the way to making the world a better place. We will do it through knowledge. We will do it through information. We will do it through books. But we do it not simply because of the materials or the things. We do it because it is ultimately our mission, and this is what we're doing. You want to know what the future of libraries is? It's not makerspaces. It's not Google. It's not what we get with overdrive. It is the fact that you are the future of this profession. Your choices today, your choices tomorrow, to stand up and say, this community, I take responsibility. This community, I will work with my partners. This community, I will favor and honor diversity and knowledge and understanding, and I will make a difference. And tomorrow, Georgia will be a better Georgia, 
The Southeast will be a better Southeast, the United States will be a better United States, and the world will be better. That's the obligation that you have in this profession. Thank you very much. I'm over time.